Hello everyone, today we're going to do another video about resonance. In the last video we did some test tuning prints in order to estimate the frequency that our tool head was vibrating at in the x and y axes. Today we're going to take that a step further and attach an accelerometer to the tool head. This will give us some really rich data on how the tool head vibrates and also how different axes can cause the other ones to vibrate. Let's get started. The basis for this video is some work that Kevin and Dimitri have been doing to implement the ADXL345 sensor. Um, it is a three axis accelerometer, it's quite inexpensive. Um, I got mine for about $6 on, on Amazon, uh, it showed up in two days. Um, it's relatively easy to wire up. So what they've done is they've essentially added the library for this sensor to Clipper and then combined it with some math um, and some different toolpath moves. So essentially what happens is the tool head moves at a specific path to induce a specific frequency of resonance. And then at the end of that toolpath, some calculations are done and it calculates how much it resonated. Um, so this process goes along for a while. It's about 20 minutes per axis, um, but it does every half hertz from 10 hertz to 100 hertz. And then at the end, it will output a plot. Um, so for instance, um, here's a plot that's in the documentation. And you can see here that you have um, X, Y, and Z axis. I believe this is probably from a Y axis test. Um, but we're in the other um, you know, manual measuring uh, the ringing pattern on the part. You really only have one dominant frequency, or if there's multiple frequencies, it, it's kind of hard to measure. Here you can clearly see the different peaks. Um, and that's really cool because then it, it gives you the ability to fine tune some of the input shaper parameters. Uh, specifically ones like this where you have two pr uh, prominent peaks, there's actually specific shape uh, kind of parameters that you can do to optimize for kind of a double hump uh, uh, resonance. And you can see in this printer specifically um, that the Y axis is the one that is the primary axis being resonated in this test, but it does induce some other ringing in X as well. Um, so you'll see this on a variety of different cases where, um, you know, depending on your printer, um, you may vibrate the frame with certain moves and certain frequencies and maybe it, it shakes the tool head or it shakes the bed um, and so you get those kind of cross uh, cross related frequencies. So I've added a live uh, stream of my printer here um, and you can kind of see that um, essentially the the tool heads there there's wires off to the right side of the tool head and I'll just switch over here uh, to uh, this image here and in this case, and this is definitely not perfect, I've adjusted the sense, but um, I was able to quickly mount it to the side of the tool head um, using an extra heat stake insert that I had uh, there. I actually had to remove the cable cover a little bit, which is why the cables are kind of everywhere. Um, but then I just ran, ran the tool head uh, wires, um, instead of through the cable chain to the accelerometer, I did them down the Bowden tube just to make it easier to remove and, and add. Uh, in this case, I'm going to uh, home my printer because it just started. And then I'm going to go through this uh, command right here. So test vibrations is what outputs this data. Um, you want to put X and Y at the center of the printer. So my printer is 250 by 250 millimeters uh, build volume. So 125, 125. A Z of 20 is fine. Um, we'll test the X axis. And then this goes from 10 to 100 hertz in uh, half hertz increments. So this test takes about 20 minutes to run. In this case, uh, I'm just going to add a, a temp to the end because this is just a temporary test. Um, and let's hit send. Let's bring this full screen here. Uh, so it's going to those coordinates we defined. And it's hard to tell, but if you look closely, you'll see that the tool head is actually wobbling back and forth. And that is to induce uh, resonance or vibrations in the x-axis. Um, and so it keeps doing this to, and then reads the accelerometer data. And you'll see, I'll hop back to the octopent screen. Um, each stage here, um, it'll say, okay, at 11 and a half hertz, it'll show the uh, resonance amount. We'll talk about this value later um, in the x, y, and z axes. And you'll note, uh, I said earlier that my X and Z are swapped because of how I mounted the accelerometer. So this last um, value here is the, really the one we're, we're interested in. 
Let's go through some of the initial data I had when I first got the accelerometer. Here's the x-axis results, essentially the same test we are running currently, uh, except fully complete and graphed. You'll notice on the y-axis is essentially the magnitude of resonance. Uh, there's a lot of kind of science behind that, and the formula on the left isn't exactly accurate except at the peak. Um, but for the instance of our discussion, let's just say that higher is worse. On the x-axis is frequency. You'll notice the data starts at 10 hertz, like we, we just specified in the test, and it goes to 100 hertz. Due to the ringing test tower print, I'd estimated my uh, frequency for x and y to be about 30 or 35 hertz. So this data is very similar to what I had estimated with the ringing test. Um, there's a very single defined peak. Uh, there's not many other um, resonances that are coupled on other axes. Uh, Z, there's a slight hump there, but it's not significant. So in this case, this, is, this should be hopefully easy to cancel out uh, with the input shaper. If we go to the y-axis, you'll see that the results are actually quite interesting. Uh, first of all, there's two really dominant frequencies here, uh, maybe in the 15 hertz and maybe 23 to 24 hertz range. And that's significant for two reasons. There's, there's two, so maybe it's harder to, to um, cancel out or you have to use a different uh, kind of formula to, to cancel it out. The other thing is the frequencies are quite low. Um, and when I saw this, after reading Dimitri's uh, guide on input shaper, he mentioned if your resonance is lower than 25 hertz, it's best to look at stiffening up your system or modifying your printer in some way to get those resonances up. And so in this case, I decided to do some belt tension studies in order to figure out what range of frequencies I could get when looking at a low to high belt tension on both core XY belts in the gantry. So what I did is I essentially loosened both of my belts to the point where there was no um, ability to loosen it further without removing the belts. And then for each increment, I tensioned the tensioner by half a turn. And that ended up stretching the belts by half a millimeter per step. So here I plotted all of the steps together. So A is the loosest and G is the tightest. And you'll see that as the belts get tighter, their frequency goes up. And then also, as the belts get tighter, the uh, resonance goes up. And this is kind of intuitive if you think about it. A guitar string, when tightened, the frequency, the pitch goes up. And this is the same thing, essentially. It's a long guitar string with belts and pulleys and masses on it, but essentially it's the same thing. The other thing is that the peak also goes up. The amount of resonance goes up. And this, if you think about it as well, if a guitar string is very loosely tensioned to where it barely vibrates at all, it's not going to continue vibrating for a long time. It's just gonna kind of flop around and stop. However, as you increase the tension, um, that frequency or that resonance will continue to get kind of um, longer lasting until you kind of reach a plateau. And, and this is kind of what you, saw, what you see here. Um, and there's always a limit. With belt tension, if you go too high, you're gonna start getting print artifacts where you'll see a two millimeter vertical uh, repeating pattern due to uh, the two millimeter pitch on most uh, GT2 belts that we use in 3D printers. So you don't wanna to go too high, and you don't wanna to go too low either, though in this case it seems like it would be better because the resonance is lower, but your positional accuracy will also be significantly lower as, um, Essentially, the belt's not constraining the tool head anymore because it has so much play in the system. For wide belt tension, we saw a very similar phenomenon, except there's some other artifacts there with kind of two peaks um, of the belt tension. And you'll see here, there's kind of a middle ground there. At the very low end, there's a lot of vibration in the like 10 to 15 hertz range, and maybe sometimes a second peak in the 20 to 30 hertz range. Um, but there's a few positions there, uh, maybe C, D, and E, um, that have a, a nice defined uh, single um, main frequency that would be easy to cancel out. As you get higher in F and G, there begins to have a more pronounced kind of dual frequency going on. I'm not exactly sure what's uh, causing that. Um, you know, there's 
could be a myriad of uh, reasons, and so if you have any thoughts, please feel free to leave them in the comments. I want to revisit this chart for a short amount of time um, because I want to touch on what the y-axis actually is. You'll notice it's 1 divided by 2 times zeta squared. Um, that value is actually a little bit inaccurate because that only applies at the very peak of each of these curves. Um, so that function, theoretically, if you take the peak of each of the curves and solve for zeta, that ends up giving you the damping frequency. And you'll see this plotted here. Um, the damping ratio um, at the very low end is around 0.3, and as it increases, it drops down to around 0.15. So what exactly is damping ratio? I'd like to touch on that for a minute as well um, by looking at this Wikipedia chart. Essentially, damping ratio tells you how long a system will continue to oscillate. Um, in this case, um, an impulse is generated, and if the damping frequency is zero, essentially it's completely undamped, and it will be uh, perpetually uh, resonating at a specific frequency. As you increase the damping ratio from zero to one, um, in that region you are said to be underdamped, where the system will overshoot your intended target and will oscillate a number of cycles, but eventually it will die out. A damping ratio of one is critically damped, where the system rest responds in the most ideal fashion, where it approaches the set target as quickly as possible without actually overshooting it. Finally, uh, damping ratios greater than one are overdamped, where the system is essentially responding slower than it actually could, and in some situations this is great, but in a 3D printer this isn't really ideal because you need to be able to respond to inputs very quickly and not have uh, kind of deviations in your path. If the system was overdamped, essentially the, you know, you wouldn't be making a circle or corner anymore, you would essentially be making, you know, a shortcut because it would be damped. Um, so in this case, um, going back to this chart, um, all of these are underdamped values. Um, so that means that essentially the target will overshoot. So if the tool head uh, moves in a certain direction or changes speeds, um, it will overshoot that intended target, um, which is essentially what ringing is. It is, um, instead of making a sharp 90 degree turn and you know, making a perfect wall afterwards, ring, uh, the ringing is um, the tool head oscillating. Um, so lower f resonant frequencies, looser tool uh, uh, belts essentially, uh, resonate less because essentially the, the resonating dies out quicker. Um, so it begs the question, is a loose belt or a tight belt better? And I'm not exactly sure about that. That's one of the things I like to look into in the future uh, with doing some testing. Um, I think if we did not have input shaper, probably the looser belt is better because you know you don't want that ring. However, if we do have input shaper where we can try to um, you know, essentially cancel out the vibration, um, it may be better to have a slightly tighter belt with a more defined frequency response. Um, so you know, that cleaner single frequency can get canceled out. I'm not sure if you have any thoughts, um, please let me know. Um, I'm gonna be doing some more testing on that in the future, uh, hopefully, and uh, if you'd like to hear more about that, let me know. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed this video as much as I have. Um, it's been really great to be able to uh, gather all this data so easily. Um, half the battle is actually getting um, you know, all the code written and tested, and it's been great to essentially be able to use someone else's work from Dimitri and Kevin, who have been adding this accelerometer implementation um, and really just you know plugging it in and, and having it run and you know getting all that data back so easily. Um, so I've been able to do um, a little more testing. There's one thing that you may be wondering about is, um, can you see the difference once input shaper is applied? And the answer to that is yes and no. With the current implementation um, that I was using, um, essentially the Pi gets overloaded um, when the, essentially the test point gets to the same value that the input shaper resonance is defined. Essentially the pi gets overloaded and it goes into shutdown. Um, there are some workarounds in this um, that Kevin and Dimitri are looking at, um, but I went ahead and connected my accelerometer to a second pi and logged the raw output 
um, versus time. At the same time, the other Pi was running the printer and moving the tool head. And that way, I was able to look at some of the oscillations that um, happen You know, when the tool head's moving in a square, and then run input shaper on and off and see how the resonance um, essentially died out differently with input shaper. There's a lot more to that, and I want to do some more uh, data collection, so I, this is you know, a future video, but I'm really excited to share that with you uh, as well. Until next time, I hope you have a good one. Bye.